Wilderness Innovation Radio. Hello, this is Perry Peacock with Wilderness Innovation. Our, uh, the subject of our uh, audio program today is, uh, is survival knowledge and uh, kind of how that uh, plays a role uh, in our lives and uh, helping us to get through some kind of a difficult situation that we may be in, whether it's uh, out in the woods, an urban type situation, or, or whatever it may be. Um, knowledge is, is a nice thing because it's something that we can carry with us in our brains. Um, you know, if we don't have a book or a manual or a video or something with us, you know, at, at all times, whatever we've plugged into our brain, is uh, is capable of being retrieved out of our brain and put into action to uh, to uh, to do something to help uh, help us or benefit us in our life um, and so what, what I want to do tonight uh, or today uh, in this uh, program is we talk about knowledge I want to get just a, a few basic concepts kind of down and kind of out of the way and then uh, most of the time, most of the uh, of the program, I want to illustrate some of the concepts by uh, stories from my own life, uh, some things I've done or been through, um, uh, maybe maybe not even good things, things I did wrong, you know, we all do that, at least I do plenty of that, um, and also from uh, uh, possibly a number of the books that I've read over the years, uh, some things there that will illustrate uh, knowledge and kind of help kind of help us uh, to realize the value of knowledge and kind of what it can do for us and uh, practical application so starting out uh, one of the first things that came to my mind was was that saying that I'm sure we've all heard over the years uh, is from uh, Lord uh, Bacon uh, back in the, I believe, uh, 1700s or something like that, uh, his statement, knowledge is power, or I think as it's been maybe more correctly put down, uh, knowledge itself is power. And, uh, and that really, uh, a lot of times we don't think about it that much. We, you know, we get in our survival world and we think about making shelter in a debris hut and we think about fire and fishing and hunting and figure four traps and you know, we think about first aid and uh, what plants we can eat and how to build a signal fire. And we, you know, we think about all those things and we don't uh, sit down and, and take a thought of, of the knowledge. How, where did the knowledge to do those things come from? Why, you know, if we're able to do that, how did we learn to do that? Where, where did we, where do we pick that up at? And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, one of the key things about about this survival knowledge and the statement of Bacon um, saying knowledge itself is power is that is if knowledge is power if we have more knowledge we have more power or in other words we have more ability really uh, it gives us more options right so so that's it that like if you have knowledge that means you have ideas you have concepts you have things floating around in your head ideas of what you can do the more of those you have in your mind, the more power you have or the more ability you have to change and improve your condition. So that's why knowledge itself is power. It gives you the power to change your, your survival situation, whether, like I say, it's urban or, or whether it's way out in the stick somewhere. Uh, it doesn't matter the situation. Whatever knowledge you have can be carried with you in your brain and be brought to use to uh, to uh, improve your situation. Um, now I, I said uh, you know at the beginning that I wanted to um, I wanted to kind of lay a little foundation before we got started, so it kind of gives a kind of a a, a ground setup and everything, kind of a place to start from. And uh, uh, one of those things is is to me I think of three basic areas when I think of survival. And uh, this is just my own personal, you know, everybody has their own way of doing things. This, to me, this is something that puts it into my head in a way that I can envision it. And and it kind of enables me to divide everything up, put everything in a category it goes in. 
And so I think about survival in the same way that I think of fire. You know, you got your fire triangle. You know, you have to have heat, <clears throat> you have to have oxygen, and you have to have fuel for a fire. <clears throat> and uh, I think, and I look at it in the same terms as survival. And uh, and that is, there's three basic categories, three basic things that uh, we need to have in order to uh, survive. And that's whether we're talking day to day. Uh, in our regular lives or whether you know it's out in some situation that we got ourselves into and so I those that triangle to me is knowledge skills and gear and I'll give it just a brief definition of what I consider those knowledge is the fa that's the foundation item um, if if you don't have knowledge how can you really even do anything let's just stumble onto it so knowledge is the, the foundation that makes the other stuff possible to me. Um, skills, that's to me, that's the action part of things. That's where, that's where things happen. That's where we take the knowledge we've learned and we develop skills. We learn skills. We practice skills. And we put that knowledge to work with skills. And so we're talking about our motor skills, our you know, working with our hands, our feet, our arms, or, you know, putting everything together to do something, to create something, to make a tool, make a shelter, you know, whatever it might be, uh, that's, that's skills. Uh, part of what I look at as skills is, that's also the ability to create. Uh, in other words, uh, you've, you've studied something, you've learned something, you have some knowledge, and... Now, you're able to take that with skills and turn that thought in your head into something in reality. So, that's part of skills. Now, the third item is gear. And that's, uh, that's either gear that you take with you that's part of your kit, part of your, you know, your, your normal situation or whatever you have in your vehicle, your ATV, snowmobile, airplane, whatever it may be. Um, and it also includes um, gear that you might fashion out of natural materials from wherever you are, whether it's an urban setting that you're using pallets and plywood, or whether you know whether you're out in a stick somewhere and you're using uh, you're using uh, pine boughs and stuff like that, or a down pine tree, or whether you're out in the Great Basin Desert or something like that, and you're 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 using sagebrush um, as some kind of a shelter or juniper tree or something like that. Uh, whether it's a cave in the mountain or piling up rocks, whatever it is, gear is that physical thing that you find or create with combining the skills and the knowledge. Um, to kind of start off with, uh, one of my favorite movies, and I don't know why exactly, I don't know. <clears throat> I like the scenery in it, and I like, I just kind of like the the story it's cool <laughs> but but anyway uh and it's and it's a fictional tale uh, it's called the edge uh, you've probably may, many of you have probably seen the movie or whatever but you know it's about a essentially about a wealthy man that uh all his life just loved books loved to study to read to learn that was kind of his thing you know he's always got his nose in a book whenever he wasn't doing something else and uh in part of the story, you know, there's there's people that would like to have some of what he has, and some of them try to contrive some kind of way to get it. And the situation evolves into a essentially survival situation. And um, and this guy played by Anthony Hopkins uh, basically winds up able to retrieve that knowledge of what he studied and uh, apply it to the airplane crash that they're in, their conditions, uh, running into bears and cold weather and, you know, finding directions, north, south, east, west, whatever. Uh, all those all those various kind of things, uh, he's able to take the, the statement of, of another, we're going to die, you know, constantly. We're going to die out here. And he's saying, we're not going to die, you know. <clears throat> we have abilities. We... You know, we can do things, we can make things better for ourselves. So, in the end, he's able to survive through using his knowledge 
uh, to accomplish some things and to get through the situation. Um, <clears throat> so that's a fictional deal, but we'll get into some real stories here in a moment. Uh, I do want to just uh, just think about this. Just think about, I don't know if you ever do or not, but how incredible of a thing that your or the organ of the brain uh, how incredible that is yeah. and uh, you know it's said that well it's actually true I mean we probably had experience of this I I remember things there's some things at certain times when something is triggered in my mind or some event happens you know I'm I'm almost 60 years old now and I can remember 50, 55 years ago, certain things that happened, and they're in, when this stimulates my mind, it, like it comes in there so clear as if it was yesterday, and, uh, and we know that our, our brains are recording, keeping track of everything we've thought or done, everything that's happened, we've observed, we've learned, for our whole lives, and it's possible, and like uh, brain surgeons, some of those guys know that they can stimulate certain parts of the brain and have and have uh, people recall with incredible detail something that's obscure from their life somewhere. And so we know the capability is there that everything that you study is possible to be retrieved when you need it the most. And uh, one other thing to go along with that is just like with exercise or anything else, when we exercise our brains, when we study and try to learn, we keep that brain more active. We keep um, the little connecting, the little links that connect different bits of knowledge together. Um, the more connections and different links we have, oftentimes we find it's easier to remember those things. And, uh, and so, you know, if we have an active program of studying and learning, which, you know, I, I'm personally, I, I love it anyway. So, I mean, a good part of my life, I've always, uh, especially reading, I love to read. I'm always reading something. And uh, so, you know, I'm putting a lot of junk in my, well, not junk, I'm putting, putting a lot of stuff in my, in my mind. I hope it's not junk. But, uh, you know, and, and oftentimes when I'm trying to think through a problem or whatever, Sometimes it's something kind of unrelated, but will pop into my mind, but it comes in such a way as, as to give me an idea for a solution to something else. So it's good to, knowledge is good because uh, to me it's like giving ourselves resources. You know, if you're, uh, like I did a trek here uh, last, uh, well, it was during the summer out on the West Desert, and there's... There is zero water. There's no water in the area where I went for the whole time I was out there. I had to take everything with me that I used, uh, other than I had one little one stash at one point that I'd pre 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 staged, I guess you could say, in case of emergency. But um, you know, I was out there and for there's very little trees, uh, no water, very little wildlife very not even a lot of plant life and so the you know your resources were very limited and um, and I look at that like your brain you know like do you want your brain to be that desert yeah uh, that's limited in resources or do you want your brain to be the you know the forest full of every kind of thing and a stream running through it and animals and plants and trees and bushes and flowers and you know uh, so I look at it like that. Put stuff into your brain, fill it up with knowledge, and you know you'll have you'll have more to uh, you'll have more ability, more options uh, when the time comes. Um, and I always consider that knowledge comes ahead of skills, as I said, because how can you execute a skill if you don't know about it yet? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like you got to have the knowledge from somewhere. Uh, in order to even do a do a skill, um, one thing I would point out is, it's well, some people are. I guess I could say some people are more capable than than others in this situation. But um, for the most part, most people 
are not able to simply go from reading a book, watching a video or a movie, and then getting out in a live situation and all of a sudden being able to plug that knowledge into their hands and arms and legs and all that sort of thing and do something really skillful. Uh, generally skills require practice and practice and practice. So I would point that out. Now, like I could say, some people are capable of, of making knowledge go to skills very easily and effective, and, but most of us are not. But regardless, practice in skills never hurts. If nothing else, even not even not even the ability to actually do it. A lot of times in the practice we learn more efficient ways to do things. So just keep that in mind. I don't want to get off on the skills because that's a whole another program or two. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, if you've been, you know, involved in the survival at all for very long, you've probably read a military manual somewhere or read a book somewhere. I know Many people, Cody Lundin, as it in his, many other people in theirs, the uh, acronym STOP, S-T-O-P. And uh, that uh, acronym stands for uh, STOP, THINK, OBSERVE, AND PLAN. And, uh, and basically, one of the most important things is to stop. Because oftentimes, whether we, you know, like say we break down somewhere, everybody always uses the lost example, which, you know, obviously that could happen. But most of the time, you know, a lot of times it's just we break, something breaks or something, you know. But regardless, it's pointless for us to just, uh, just go around. I, like, I liken it to like a, pin, a ball in a pinball machine bouncing all over the place. I mean, that's pointless to get into that. So it's important to stop and think about what just happened, where we're at. You know, if you just broke down, how did it happen, what went on. Sometimes it's a simple thing. You know, a chain slipped off a gear, a, a pin came out somewhere, a bolt came off. You know, I don't know. Oftentimes it's a simple thing. But if we don't take the time to stop and think about it and we just start running around, bouncing around like a pinball, then we just wear ourselves out, worry ourselves up, perhaps get ourselves in more danger. And uh, where we might have sat down and thought about it for five minutes and realized what it was and been on our way. So anyway, I don't want to get real heavily into the acronym STOP, but it's worth pointing out that it's <clears throat> stopping, thinking about things, where we're at, what happened, if we did become lost, where, when was the last time that we knew we were not lost, you know, so sometimes you can kind of backtrace yourself and kind of figure it out. Uh, and then observe, which is kind of observing conditions, observing resources, where you're at, where you need to get to, what you need to do. And then you take all those things, put that together and make a plan so that you're not just helter skelter, just going about things, but you actually have a direction, you actually, uh, you know, actually going to get somewhere with it. So, uh, I know Cody, I think it's, yeah, it was Cody Lundin in one of his books. He adds the letter A onto the end of stop because he said, I think he said he had Swedish ancestry or something and they spell it S-T-O-P-A. And he, the A is for action, act, do it, do something about it. You know, if you make a plan and don't act on the plan, it doesn't really do much, you know. So anyway, that's really, uh, the, I guess, before I get off of the STOP acronym, the main thing I wanted to point out there is that when it comes time for planning, the knowledge that you have from your studies will come back into your mind because now you're thinking about, okay, what can I do? So because you've gone through this whole procedure of the STOP uh, scenario, um, when you're executing that procedure, it actually stimulates your brain. And your brain starts researching back in there. Your brain's got its little search engine. You know, it's got its little Google search engine going in there. And, um, and, and so you're, uh, 
your brain starts firing back answers to your solutions and then you can take those and weigh those out and choose you know which is the best one to go by so that's really one of the reasons I want to point out that because yeah, if if in your training that's something that you would typically do and I would recommend it uh, is to execute that sort of a, a situation the stop uh, procedure whatever knowledge you have is going to be to your advantage when you do that all right now quickly um, talking about where does where does knowledge come from and how you know how do you learn and we don't need to spend a big deal of time on it but just want to point out you know there to me I, I see six different uh, ways that I, I think that we obtain knowledge and one of them is reading reading or reading studying that sort of thing and uh, that's one of my primary ways I I, I love reading so I, I do a lot of that and I consider that to be an active method of, of obtaining knowledge because you're you're having to kind of concentrate as you read to make those words get into your brain and mean something and to comprehend them and uh, and when I'm reading I when I if I have a book I'm making notes all over the place underlining things highlighting things writing things in the margins making notes or thoughts that sort of thing so when I read I, I am reading and studying that helps me to remember and that sort of thing. Another method is video or visual, uh, TV, movies, YouTubes, uh, or just things that we see or observe. And uh, that's kind of, to me, kind of a passive method. Not that that's bad or anything. But it, oftentimes it's easier for our mind to wander off because we're just sitting there watching a screen. It's easy to kind of, you know, get your let your mind wander at times um, but it's still a very valuable way because it does give you does go, give you visual learning um, one of the one of the real effective ways is classes or schooling or seminars or some kind of a training scenario deal and that's kind of an interactive thing because typically you're going to hear something you may read something uh, you may watch something and then typically in those situations you're also going to do something an, an action a skill and so those are very valuable um, experience is another way sometimes you know we always hear hey, learn by experience and uh, commonly that's called the school of hard knocks <laughs> and the, the reason for that is the old saying and I don't know who said it but I just remember hearing it all my life um, Experience is a great teacher, but you have to remember one thing. Experience gives the test first and the lesson afterwards. So that's, uh, that's important to remember. Because if you're planning on learning by experience, you're going to have that trial, that test, that hard time. And then you're going to have to figure things out and afterwards look back on it and think, oh, okay, that's what I learned. <laughs> so experience is not a preparedness kind of thing I mean once you've had the experience you've learned something but you know but it is a good teacher I mean when you go through something think about the times in your life you know you've learned something uh, when I get through these last two real quickly and then get into some of these stories and kind of illustrate some of this real quickly here in the time we have left another thing to think about knowledge comes also from innate sense in other words it's just a part of your being part of who you are um, possibly something you've inherited from parents or grandparents, some ancestor. It's kind of, you know, everybody ha typically has some kind of thing that comes easy to them. And um, some of these kind of things are some of those innate senses or innate abilities. And, uh, and there's just, you know, you wind up, there's some things that nobody has to tell you. Uh, you just seem to know it. And so that's kind of that innate sense. So that's that's something there that is there uh, and the last thing I think of is the senses your sight smell sound touch etc uh, I consider also conversation as part of that senses learning type of a thing uh, in the in the in the sense of sound and that sort of thing and um, 
and I, you know, you look at that, and that's like uh, plant identification or something like that. You know, you can see something in a book or whatever, but when you get out there, say you're out there with somebody that knows, and they point out, hey, there's, you know, there's miner's lettuce, or there's shepherd's purse, or there's, you know, whatever. There's mint, or there's, there's stinging nettle. There's a, there's a touch one. You touch stinging nettle, you know, hey, that's stinging nettle. <laughs> Um, but seeing seeing a plant, being able to smell it, to uh, to hear an animal or or whatever, uh, different things like a, hear an elk bugling at night or something like that, you know, uh, being able to touch something or feel something, uh, all these kind of things are also ways of learning, and when we combine multiple ways, it helps build more links in our brain it helps us to recall things easier so that's that's basically my little spiel on knowledge and stuff and I want to illustrate a few a few things about knowledge just with some stories and that sort of thing uh, one of them I'll give a story about early in my life when I was considerably younger than I am now and quite a bit less experienced but nevertheless at that time I had as a as a child and a youth, I was always interested in survival and stuff, and I played around with it a uh, good bit of my life, just having fun with it here and there. But uh, got out on a on a deer hunting type thing, guiding some people into an area that I knew very well. And uh, as far as deer population, we got into there, and and as will happen in the mountains. Uh, especially some of the higher altitudes and stuff, sometimes you get a change in condition very rapidly that you hadn't anticipated. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and that was the case here. Uh, wound up in a, a storm coming up that uh, was quite, quite windy, rainy, turned to snow, back to rain, back to snow, back to rain, back to snow, and eventually just the snow and uh, we were not prepared at all for that we had windbreakers on and we're hiking way above our camp just scouting out the day before the opening of the hunt and uh, went up over the mountain ridge and dropped down into another valley at this lake that we planned to plan to do some hunting at and we got trapped on the other side of the mountain there and uh, just just unreasonable to try to get back up over the top and back down to our camp so we we had to make do with what we had and where we were at uh, not much in the way of any kind of trees or anything that mostly mostly knee-high dry grass that was now wet from all the rain and snow and everything and sagebrush and that was about all about all there was around there <clears throat> well Due to, due to the knowledge that I had from my studies, experiences, things I'd tried, things I'd read about, I knew that, you know, we would be in danger of hypothermia uh, if we didn't do something fairly quickly to get ourselves uh, sheltered, get ourselves warmed up. And, uh, and so we basically we constructed out of sagebrush a big ring or donut, I guess you could call it, uh, big enough for three of us to uh, lay in head head to foot head to foot head to foot with the fire in the middle and uh, and we built this ring of sagebrush about five five or six feet high and three feet thick all the way around us and it blocked the wind from us very effectively blocked a lot of the rain and snow and uh, and uh, we were able to keep a nice warm fire uh, kept us nice and warm and cozy and uh, we slept through the night we had our firewood right there to throw on the fires that died down we kept it easily going through the night woke up in the morning with uh, four or five inches of snow on the ground and quite cold and uh, we were so cozy where we were at we almost didn't want to get up and go hunting <laughs> but uh, but a little bit of knowledge in there helped us in both in the fire building with which was difficult under the circumstances and also coming up with a shelter option 
uh, out in the middle of the, the grass and sagebrush area. So, you know, that's, that's one little experience. Um, in the book, Adrift, uh, 76 Days Lost at Sea, Steve Callahan, uh, his uh, new boat sh is uh, sunk in a storm. And he uh, spends, uh, as the title of the book says, 76 days on an inflatable raft with a hole in it. And uh, he, he is able to survive because of his knowledge of how his gear and equipment worked uh, primarily. And also helpful was his knowledge of the ocean and currents and some of the animals and fish and some of that sort of thing was helpful. One of the key things was he had a solar still that would ride on the water on an inflatable tube and the sun would would uh, would come into there and heat things up then it would evaporate water up through the middle of this tube and uh, it would distill when it hit the uh, the plastic kind of a kind of a cone shaped deal and then this uh, distilled water would run down and be caught in a trough around the edges uh, where it could be <clears throat> could be siphoned off and and drank from there and be due to some circumstances there they uh, had two of those stills and they weren't working hardly at all but because he was aware of how they're supposed to work he was able to adapt some things and be able to make do uh, well enough to get him through the through the experience most of the way um, he also had you know, like as his raft was leaking pretty much the whole time, so he's constantly having to pump it up, and uh, and he was able, due to his knowledge and being kind of handy, uh, come up with some ways to try to to try to patch the leak as best he could and and get by with it, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> by tying it off, and that sort of thing is quite an elaborate difficult situation it had to do especially with sharks swimming around trying to trying to bite you while you're in the water leaning in the water trying to do some of this stuff so it's, it's quite a nice book if you get a chance to read it it's very good and uh, there's a lot of things there um, there's another thing I can I, an illustration I like from uh, Jim Bridger a book written by uh, J.C. Salalder and uh, he he kind of talks about a lot of the myths of Jim Bridger as well as some of the true things. And But uh, one of the things that Bridger was known for uh, as an explorer of the uh, Old West in the United States and a, and a trapper, he had an incredible ability to, to remember the terrain that he passed through and all the details about it. And he was able to guide many people, uh, give them directions and things and tell, give them helpful points and tips uh, because of his extensive knowledge and able to remember things so his his knowledge came mostly by experience from being there but it was proved very valuable and uh, and so that's kind of to illustrate it doesn't matter where you get your knowledge from it's just important to get it and to get as much as you can and one of the good things about that little story about Jim Bridger is you know a lot of us uh, I don't say us. A lot of people get themselves lost because they don't remember very well the terrain they're passing through. And when they turn around to come back, a lot of times they don't recognize it because they haven't seen it from looking that direction. And they find themselves very confused and disoriented. So it's, it's good to kind of take an example from Jim Bridger and try to be observant as we pass through various areas and terrain and try to remember some details about it which could help us should we be returning back through there or if we run into somebody that we have to give them some guidance we'll be able to remember that well enough to do it um, let's see one of the other books that I uh, enjoyed reading is called Rowing to Latitude by Jill Fredston who is uh, who uh, competed in rowing and that sort of thing in uh, in in school and that sort of thing and uh, I think semi-professionally and uh, she loved to love to row and uh, in her in her boat she didn't really uh, she had kind of a specialized type boat not so much a kayak but but anyway 
uh, her specialty was she she did a lot of rowing up in the north countries, uh, northern North America, northern Canada, Alaska, Greenland. Took many trips down various rivers. Did the Northwest Passage. Uh, all kinds of things like that, and uh, her life was saved many times by her study and becoming aware of the climate, the conditions, you know, such as prevailing winds, prevailing currents, uh, animals, uh, polar bears, Kodiak bears, grizzly bears, all those kind of many things that could come up. Uh, her, her study in that thing saved her life many times. Uh, and helped her complete the the treks and the journey she went on. That's an interesting book. I'm not really even a rowing guy or or somebody that would probably ever do that sort of thing that she did, but uh, but it's still a quite interesting read. Um, one other another one is uh, Hey I'm Alive by Helen Claiborne. Uh, she was a city girl from from New York. Um, who decided at a young age to venture out into Alaska and see the real world and uh, got out there and settled in a little bit and decided uh, to get a little more adventure and uh, uh, there was a pilot who advertised on the radio for a passenger to ride with him down to his home area of San Francisco and uh, he worked I believe in the oil fields and would be up there several months and then go home for say a month so having an airplane and flying home allowed him more time with his family when he had his time off and he'd usually advertise for a passenger that would help pay for the gas and and uh, give him a little company on this particular time uh, this particular adventure uh, unfortunately the plane crashed and they were exposed to uh, living in conditions uh, 30 40 below zero many times uh, and I believe it was 40, I don't know, 45 to 47 days or something, most of which without any food. The only food they had with them when they crashed was enough for lunch that one day. They had virtually no supplies, no nothing. It's amazing how little they had. But uh, but they, they knew a few things. They knew they needed water. They uh, cut off the tops of oil cans, which back in those days in the 60s were oil cans were all metal. And so they put snow in those over a fire and melted snow into water to drink. And pretty much all they did is drink water for a month and a half. But they, in spite of some of their injuries and that sort of thing, they survived fine. And after they were rescued, uh, it only took a week or two. And they were, other than their injuries, they were... Their bodies were recovered, and they were they were good to go. So even with poor knowledge, they had enough basic knowledge to to get them through. In fact, the pilot uh, finally, <clears throat> and kind of looking back, I, I kind of look at the story, and if if you want to get the book and uh, read it, or I, even you can uh, YouTube uh, search on YouTube, and they actually uh, was a movie made on the about the story as well. Hey, I'm alive, <clears throat> but. Uh, when I look at the story, I kind of amazed they lived, and then the other side of it, I'm thinking how much better things could have been had they had more knowledge, even without the gear that they should have had, that they didn't have. More knowledge would have helped them greatly. Perhaps they might have even got rescued much sooner. In the end, uh, the pilot wound up making some snowshoes and hobbled out into a found a logging camp and was able to <clears throat> get a plane. Uh, sent in there to kind of find Helen and and uh, kind of get the rescue underway but but anyway so that's a kind of an interesting story there uh, two other two other little short deals uh, the book endurance by Frank Worsley tells the story of uh, of uh, Sir uh, Ernest Shackleton who uh, explored the Antarctic areas in the early days and uh, on one particular expedition, which partly was scientific, their ship became uh, locked in the ice in Antarctica, and uh, the ice finally, eventually crashed, uh, smashed the boat into pieces, and it sunk. And they were forced to evacuate whatever they could off the boat and supplies, and put them in their lifeboats that they had, uh, and then they 
turn their their boats into uh, sleds to pull across the ice. And uh, the interesting thing was that uh, Shackleton had his men uh, grab some things that probably a lot of us wouldn't think about. And uh, that is, he had them bring books, uh, like the Bible. He had them bring, I think they had some books on some plays, maybe some Shakespeare or something. I can't remember exactly the details, but... <clears throat> But during their trekking across the ice, instead of everybody at night going, woe is me, they'd write in journals, they'd read from the books, or they would do plays or musical type things, or they'd uh, basically, you know, they'd make up little programs among the crew, which helped to keep their minds lightened and kind of, uh, kind of gave a more positive spin on things. And so kind of, uh, I'm looking at this as, uh, I kind of like that because they took some knowledge with them. They took some of these things. They took uh, guitars and some things like that so they could. <clears throat> and some of those kind of things, um, kind of some of those kind of things I think are kind of knowledge related and it helped them keep a more po positive attitude. And during the, uh, I think it was approximately 18 months of this, <laughs> this uh, experience, not one of the crew members died. Everyone's everyone lived everyone was saved through the experience and i think part of that is just kind of due to the knowledge shackleton had of human nature and, and not only just the environment and the elements and all that but human nature how to keep people's minds focused how to take their minds off the bad and throw some good stuff in there to kind of uh, keep people positively focused uh, the last um, story I want to tell uh, is some things out of the book. Uh, and this, incidentally, is one of my very favorite books on survival. And uh, I kind of stumbled into it. But it's uh, the book Island of the Lost. Um, I don't, there's some other parts to it. Something uh, lost on a subarctic island. It's, it's, sub it's in the subantarctic. Very cold, cruel conditions down there. Uh, it was written by Joan Druitt. She's the one that did the research for it. But it illustrates very well uh, a crew lost on this island that uh, would have hurricane force winds blowing rain and snow at the same time. Just brutal, brutal, brutal conditions. And just just a horrible, I, I don't know, I read it, I don't even know how they just even existed through it all, but the thing that really saved him was the resourcefulness, uh, the knowledge particularly of one, one man, uh, Renal. And, uh, but they adapted. They, they made a, they knew they're, they knew they're going to be there at least a month or more. So they built a house and, uh, kind of a cabin, but it's pretty good, pretty 12 by 24, pretty decent size with a big stone fireplace. Um, they utilized resources off their crash ship. Uh, eventually, they wound up making or kind of creating a ship out of out of their shore boat, their man boat, I guess you'd call it. But they had to make it bigger and make it more, make it seaworthy. And to do that, they had to make their own nails. Well, these guys knew some things. They knew they had they knew they had some metal on the crash ship that they could get. But they need to make nails out of it, so they had to make a forge, a blacksmith deal. They had to make their own tools, so they made their own bellows. And uh, and it's amazing from the lives of some of the previous members of the crew, some of the things they'd learned before through experience or through doing things or learning somehow, study, whatever, they were able to marshal all the resources they needed from what they had on hand and uh, wound up creating the means to get off the island and get people back to rescue the rest of the guys uh, through the resourcefulness. But that is an incredible story. I'd, I would recommend that to anybody to read that book. I've read it, uh, I think, two or three times now. Very, very good book. It really illustrates Several things, knowledge, resourcefulness, skills, uh, uh, very much on leadership. Uh, I don't want to get into that book. I could talk for an hour on it. But, but anyway, those are just some examples of, of, uh, of just, uh, just the, the value of knowledge. However you obtain the knowledge, um, 
in all in every case here whatever knowledge the people had was what saved their lives and uh, there's many many other stories we could talk about but i just wanted to give a just a glimpse and just a little bit of a just a little bit of things that kind of come to mind with me but uh but anyway um that's just just to kind of go back uh, my one of my initial statements there uh knowledge itself is power it is what gives us the creativity it's what it's what gives us options in our lives when we come into a situation uh our knowledge that we have is what gives us that creative path to figure out what can I do what how can I make my situation better how can I get rescued uh if I need to if I need to make something or create something how can I do it with what's here um you know in the back to that book uh, island of the lost uh when they built their chimney in their in their cabin they had stones but there was nothing there wasn't even any clay on the island they needed some kind of mortar so they wound up making their own cement and that just because of their knowledge they knew that uh the uh the shells from the uh like uh, oyster type mussels or whatever laying around the shore they knew they could put those on a hot fire and and burn those down and make lime and then they could you know mix the lime with some sand and that sort of thing they could make a mortar kind of a cement mortar and that was just just one other illustration of uh you got to read that book if you don't read any other book that is just it's a great story as well but but anyway knowledge is power it's what gives us the ability to survive it's what gives us the ability to do things to to uh better our lives no matter what whether it's survival or not really uh just in our regular lives our knowledge can come to our to our aid so just advise you know whether you're reading watching videos youtubes or taking classes whether it's just you know partly experience out there trying things or there's something uh, you know some knowledge abilities you're born with uh you're just your senses or whatever try to always be learning it's i to me it's fun i love it i love learning things there's uh, no matter who wrote the book or whatever i always come away learning something uh from somebody so uh just uh this Perry Peacock Wilderness Innovation hope everybody uh enjoyed this little deal about knowledge and hope everybody will do the best to to learn what they can and then put that to use uh we'll have some other things come up here on on skills and gear along the way too but uh but just do what you can uh have fun outdoors enjoy your time try to learn while you're out there and uh and uh just remember things things are possible uh when you've got knowledge and uh take care have a good day and uh hope to hope to, uh, you follow us on our facebook page or uh watch our videos on youtube take these uh audio programs our blogs newsletters whatever uh read books all that sort of thing get whatever knowledge you can and take care and uh we'll be able to see you around and uh maybe we'll meet up someday so uh once again Perry Peacock Wilderness Innovation have a great day